Great pleasure to uh, be part of this symposium. I've really enjoyed the, uh, the talk so far, and I hope we'll, we'll keep that going through this one. So three weeks ago, we opened a um, new health and wellness center at the University of Colorado Medical School. And I'm going to tell you about that at the end, but what I want to tell you about, first of all, is the problem we're addressing, and then I think you'll see how we set up the center to hopefully address that uh, problem. A little bit about me, I started my career as a physiologist, and as you're going to see from the talk, I've strayed a good bit into behavior and public health and economics. So whether you see me as a physiologist gone bad or not, I'll let you decide as we go through the talk. What I wanted to start with was to tell you a little about the problem we're addressing, a tiny bit about why it's a problem, but really to look at um, what we can do in terms of um, developing strategies to address this problem. I've really spent my career studying obesity, and um, as you can see in this slide, uh, we have a real issue in this country with obesity. Right now, it's in thirds. About a third of adults at a healthy weight, a third overweight, and a third obese. You can see from this chart that it really is interesting. In the early 80s, obesity rates, which had been fairly level and not very high, started going up. This is when I, I started work in the 80s and uh, late 70s, 80s, and obesity wasn't much of a problem and nobody was very interested in it. That's turned around now as obesity rates have gone so high. I was going to ask you why you think obesity rates have gone up, but Dr. Nicholson yesterday stole my thunder. If I have the quote right, it's something like, if you sit on your ass and eat pork rinds, what do you expect? <laughs> um, pretty, pretty much nails it. Um, genes are very involved in obesity, but if you look at the increase in weight over time, uh, our sense is that the environment's playing a large role there. Uh, for example, if you look around this room at how everybody varies in weight and size and everything, that really is genetics at work. But over the last 10 years, the average adult has gained one to two pounds a year on average, and that's largely the influence of the environment. And by the way, we, we do have scales under your seat, so everybody is being weighed, and next year at the symposium, we're going to see if you hit that one to two pounds or not. Uh, look at the insert, though, of morbid obesity. This is the most rapid growing aspect of obesity. So what you're seeing are more and more people who look like the woman in the caption. It's still very low, it's still five or six percent, but it was pretty much at zero. And so it's not that we're obese, it's that we're even getting more obese. So if we look at the average BMI, even though obesity rates may have leveled a little bit, um, and we'll come back to that, That's, I, I think that may be an artificial plateau, the average weight is still going up. So it's not just that we're fat, we're getting even fatter. And children aren't immune to this. While adult obesity has doubled over the past few decades, childhood obesity has tripled. In the 1960s, childhood obesity was a rare event. There were some kids that were overweight and obese, but not very many. Now, anywhere between 15 and 30% of the kids are obese. Um, uh, as we look more and more, we're finding more and more obesity. Our definitions are conservative, so probably this is an underestimation of the problem. One of the things that we know is that most of these children do not grow out of it. Fat babies do not grow up and be lean adults. Most of them grow up to be overweight and obese adults. So it's very difficult with childhood obesity rates at an all-time high to think that somehow we've turned the corner on adult obesity. I think it's gonna get much worse before it gets better. So hopefully I've depressed you enough here at the beginning with how bad things are. I'm actually gonna try to be optimistic at the end. So, so why do we care? Why do we care that people are obese? Why don't we just make the seats bigger and the airplane seats bigger and the coffins bigger and everything and just adapt to a larger society? Well, there, you know, that, that's one solution, but there are a number of other ways of doing it. And by the way, even though I study obesity and my tendency is that everything is about obesity, the problem isn't obesity. Obesity is the marker for the problem, which is unhealthy lifestyles. But it's a pretty good marker. Uh, obesity rates have gone up in every state since we have began collecting information. If they ever went down, it would be a marker for the fact that we're taking lifestyle in the right direction. So it's a pretty good marker. 
We know that um, obesity is followed by most all of the chronic diseases from which we die. So type 2 diabetes follows obesity like night follows day. Not every obese person will get type 2 diabetes, but if there were no obesity, type 2 diabetes would be a rare condition. We're seeing type 2 diabetes in children. This is a condition that is 100% preventable. There is no reason in an enlightened society like ours that we should ever let any child get type 2 diabetes. Totally preventable. Behind diabetes is um, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, et cetera. All these are related to lifestyle, and they're driving our health care costs. And I could throw out all kinds of hundreds of billions of dollars attributed to this, uh, and we could argue over that, but it's a large number. If we could get a handle on lifestyle, it would be one way of turning around the increase in health care costs. This is the framework I've always used to approach obesity. Um, and, and it seems simple, it's actually much more complex than this, but at some level, it's energy in and energy out. And there is some regulation or certainly integration going on in the body. If there weren't, your weight would fluctuate widely from one day to the other because you don't eat the same thing every day and you don't do the same amount of physical activity. So there's certainly some integration, if not regulation, but over time, if you're going to get obese, the only way you can do that is to take in more calories than you expend. The only way you can lose weight is reverse it, expend more calories than you take in. Now, there's a huge uh, neural regulation of that. In the past few years, this science has just been fantastic of understanding the pathways that are involved in body weight regulation. We know this system is affected by genetics. It's always been affected by genetics. There are people that are much more susceptible to gaining weight and being obese, and there are people that are more resistant, and genetics play a role at each of these levels. But the environment also plays a role, and as we look at the increase in obesity from the 1980s to present, most people attribute the primary driving force to the environment. So how does the environment work? Well, the environment works to increase food intake and decrease physical activity. And it seems to be unidirectional. There aren't a lot of environmental things that reduce food intake. There aren't a lot of environmental things that increase activity. So if you're driving food intake up and energy expenditure down, what happens is the body, in, a, in an effort to reach equilibrium, becomes obese. So I look at obesity not as a biological or physiological defect, but as the body adjusting perfectly normally to the environment we live in. So as you become obese, if your in intake is higher, as you become obese, your metabolic rate goes up, your energy expenditure adjusts, and you reach energy balance, but at a higher level of body weight. So the question, in my mind, is not what's wrong biologically with obesity, but wh how can we reach energy balance in the current environment at a lower level of body weight? And I think that's really going to be a challenge. So what we're recognizing, it's not the physiology that's broken, it's the environment that's broken. The food environment, the physical activity environment, and the instant gratification, which is, uh, is really important. Bad choices are very rewarding in the present. And if we're using long-term motivation as a reason to change, it may not be sufficient. So I could show you many, many ways in which the environment has changed over time. And in fact, if you were to go around the room, we could probably name hundreds of, of things that have changed that have led to uh, obesity. In some ways, we've created the perfect storm. Our biology uh, is not causing obesity, but it's very tolerant of obesity because if you look, for most of our history, the problem is starving to death. So we really developed biological systems to preserve energy. So eating a little extra is no big deal. You sock it away in fat cells, a beautiful system, the next famine that comes along, you're in great shape. We just haven't had a famine in a while, so it keeps going in and not coming out. So your biology, essentially, it, you are geared to eat when food's available. I, I, once I, I did a, was quoted in the newspaper as saying, humans are eating machines. But in a way, it is. We have all these redundant systems to eat. So when I make food available to you all the time, you eat. Big deal. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we probably don't have a get-off-the-couch gene. We're not genetically driven to be active if we don't have to. Go back a few generations, 
What your ancestors wanted more than anything else was to have a constant source of food and to not have to work very hard. Okay, we've achieved that today. A lot of good things, but along with that has come obesity. So your body's saying, eat when food's available and rest when you don't have to work. Well, guess what? Food's always available and you never have to work. So what's surprising is that not everybody's obese, right? Uh, so um, economics also plays a role, especially in this country. We love a deal. We'll drive across town to save a nickel on the toilet paper, right? So it's like supersizing and more for less. Food was so cheap that the food industry started bundling it up and say, we'll give you twice as much as you need for 39 cents more, and we just can't pass that up. On the activity side, economics is time in front of the computer. That's how we measure productivity. And then in social systems, what we're finding is people in the same social network tend to weigh the same. Okay, it's not that obesity is contagious, it's that people tend to hang out with people that do the same as them, so in a way, obesity is being pushed by biology, by economics, and social systems. So from this, we created the environment, and I laugh every time I hear people say, gosh, we've got this toxic environment, it's crazy, it's causing problems. Well, guess what? The aliens didn't come down and create this environment. We created it, and we created it to serve the biology. We created an environment where Food's always available. We asked the food industry to give us low-cost food, make it easily available, uh, make it taste good, and then they also served it in large portions. On the activity environment, what we have worked hard to do is to create an environment where we don't have to work very hard, okay? We did this, we did this, and one of the things that I'll keep coming back to, by and large, we like it. So as we're talking about changing the environment, most of these things, we don't want to give up. Are you willing to give up your computers to reduce obesity? I don't know. So from this, what you have are very, very powerful forces promoting food intake and decreased physical activity. And the result is obesity. And, and I point this out to show that we aren't going to reverse this with hats and t-shirts. We're gonna to have to have some big social systems, some big ways of thinking to reverse all these other things. In fact, um, Margaret Talbert made this quote, the causes of obesity are so manifold and so basic as to be inseparable from the way we live. Another way of looking at that is obesity is an unintended side effect of societal progress. When Ray Kroc founded McDonald's, I don't think it was a plot to make America obese. It contributed, but I don't think it was intentional. We could go on and on through um, that sort of logic. So what's it going to take to turn this around? Because it is a battleship. It's not a small craft that's going to turn quickly. It's a battleship that's going to turn slowly. Well, our challenge is pretty simple. We produce behavior changes that are opposed by our biology and our environment, and we produce changes to an environment that people pretty much like the way it is, right? So that's what's hard about that. So where do we start? Well, it's pretty easy, really. <laughs> this, uh, for any of you from the UK, would recognize this as the Foresight Report, and I put it up not to be funny. In fact, it's brilliant. What it shows is that every one of these pathways is important to understanding obesity. So I think we do have to recognize the complexity, but I don't think our solutions have to be complex. I think we have to have simple solutions and we can do that if we recognize the complexity. I hear all people all the time saying, gosh, we've got to create a culture of health. We've got to create an environment where the healthy choice is the easy choice. Yeah, how are we going to do that? That's, that's you know, motherhood and apple pie, and that's the, the payoff. But how do we really do that? And what kinds of changes is it going to take? We've been really interested in my lab over the past few years in actually looking at, OK, Americans love to say, What's the minimum? What's the minimum exercise? What's the minimum this and that I have to do? So what we've been thinking about is what's the minimum amount of behavior change we need? Uh, are we going to have to change everything or can we get through this with changing a few things? And we published a paper in Science in 2000 and, uh, 2003 that really suggested a different way forward. What we did is we went back and looked at how we got here in terms of obesity, and this is when we found that on average people gain one to two pounds a year. One to two pounds a year. Who the heck notices if you weigh a pound more this year than last year? It's a decade later, whoa, 10 pounds, where'd that come from? So it's this gradual situation, and the way I look at it 
is um, the environment is this powerful stream, and, and our physiology is trying to push back against it, but it's not working enough. We're gradually being swept down, even though we're trying to, to go against it, we're gradually losing the battle. So what we did is conceptually, we came up with the concept called the energy gap. The energy gap is essentially how much behavior change you need to solve a problem. So we looked at weight loss, and I could give a whole lecture on weight loss. We are wildly successful in producing weight loss. We're hopeless in keeping it off. So what we get is this weight cycling. We lose weight, we regain it. I'll give anybody in the room money back guarantee on weight loss. What I can't give you a money back guarantee is on keeping it off. The reason being, your physiology is opposing it. When you're obese and you lose weight, your metabolic rate goes down, all kinds of physiological changes that force you back up. So to keep your weight off, you've got to oppose those biological changes, and you also have to impose the environment that got you there in the first place. So most people who lose weight regain it. We're actually studying a group of people who have successfully kept it off, and at another time I can talk about that group. There are a few people who succeed, so I don't want to lose all hope, but most people don't because the energy gap in going from uh, an obese state to a um, normal state is several hundred calories a day, okay? Several hundred calories a day. Uh, if you want to lose 20%, it's probably four, 450 calories a day that you would have to change your behavior by. That's very, very difficult. But the other way we looked at it is what would happen if we just simply prevented further weight gain, just keeping the situation from getting worse. And what we found here is much more encouraging. 100 calories a day would do it for 90% of the adult population. Since we put it out there, people all over the world have sort of looked at the energy gap in their population, and in most cases, it's less than 50 calories a day. So the whole concept is, if we could modify energy balance by 50 to 100 calories a day, to, to give you a sense, one soft drink, sugar-containing soft drinks, 150 calories. Um, you know, walking a mile is 200 calories. So you're talking now about some changes, while not easy, that are doable. So these kinds of changes can make a difference. This is a long-term strategy. If we said right now, every single person, whether you're normal weight, overweight, or obese, no more weight gain, over a couple of generations, we would begin to lower obesity rates. We don't have the ability right now to do it by treating obesity. And the other thing is, once you're obese, the metabolic changes that occur tend to preserve the obese state. So I don't think treatment is ever the way out of this. I think prevention is the way out of that. So this gives us some hope that we can actually do this without totally having to transform our lives. But where do you start? Who, where, what, when, how? All these questions um, we take a look at. So we, we started out, because I'm a physiologist, we started out looking at the biology. And in, in, gosh, a decade of work in understanding this, I came to the conclusion that our biological energy balance system is functioning perfectly. That's not the problem. It's, perf it's functioning perfectly. But I think we have to appreciate the biology as we go forward with strategies. And I'll illustrate that here. We know that when I overfeed or underfeed you, your metabolism changes. But it seems to be stronger to protect against weight loss than against weight gain. That's a physiological fact that we need to understand as we look at strategies. What we know is that losing weight, producing negative energy balance, produces a very strong physiological response. So we need to stay away from those kinds of strategies when possible. Another one is physical activity. In my field, I get so crazy at people asking the question of, is obesity due to eating too much or too little physical activity? The answer to that question is obviously yes. But if you ask that question, I think you don't understand how body weight regulation works. Here's the way um, I think about physical activity. And, and, and this is not, don't take this as dogma. This is our working hypothesis, and this goes back to work from John Mayer in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, who noticed that people who got a lot of activity in their lives through work were better at regulating their weight than people that didn't. And so the concept is there may be a threshold of physical activity above which our biological system works best, below which it didn't. So if you take this line as the threshold, what you see is if you're above this threshold, 
and you exercise more, you eat more to maintain energy balance. So the more you exercise, the more you eat. So the system is working great. And we look at this aspect as physical activity pulling food intake along. We think that's how our body weight regulation works best. Now, if you're below this, you're in a system of dysregulation where even though your activity goes down, your food intake goes up. And what's happening there is food intake is driving the show. So because most of the people in this country anyway are to the left of the bar, it looks very much like food intake is the most important thing going on. And everybody looking at this says food intake is the problem. That's where we've got to address it. I believe that unless we get activity ab above that line, there's nothing we're going to do with food intake. That doesn't mean food intake is important, just the opposite. Food intake is so critical that we've got to get our activity up. And quite simply, our strategy for addressing obesity has been uh, eat less and exercise more. I think that's exactly the wrong answer. We have decades of showing that food restriction does not work. If I increase your physical activity, you might actually eat more and maintain your body weight. So I think we have to reevaluate some of these concepts. So what about behavior? Let's focus on behavior. Let's just get people to understand the diet behaviors they need and the physical activity behaviors. What's the, what's the matter with that? Let's give them the information. Let's educate them. Let's go out and let them do the right kinds of things. Well, we've had very poor success in doing that. And one of the things that is missing, and I'm going to hammer this over and over and over, is the why. As we're asking people to change, I just told you that we have an environment that most people like. Sure, everyone would like to be at a healthy weight, but are they willing to do what it would take? And people know that. People come into our programs and say, I know exactly what I should be doing. Well, why aren't you doing it? I think part of it is we don't have a good motivation. It requires environmental support and peer support. Here's part of the problem. The biology of choice, our brains are geared towards short-term reward. So if you have that 16-year-old at the counter deciding whether to supersize the french fries, what you're weighing on one hand is the smell and taste and good deal. On the other hand, you're going to get diabetes in 30 years. It's, it's a no-brainer. We say, oh, well, I'll make the good decision next time. We can't just have the long-term outcomes, and I think the outcomes can't even be health outcomes. We've got to give some short-term rewards for doing this. So two of our strategies, national strategies, have been to promote physical activity and increase fruits and vegetables. Well, how are we doing on that? <laughs> What's the definition of madness, doing the same thing and expecting a different result? Here's our, here's our success in increasing fruits and vegetables. Here's our success with physical activity. These are two huge national strategies that we continue out there promoting. I think the result is not going to change. Okay, so biology behavior, let's get to the real problem, the environment. So what, it is, what is it in the environment we need to change? I've put a list up here. There, you, we could probably double this. I don't disagree that the environment is the problem. The problem is you aren't going to fix one thing, and that's what we want to do. If we could just get rid of high fructose corn syrup, everything would be great. If we just got rid of McDonald's, if we just did this or that, you can take any one of these, you can take any 10 of these and change them. I don't think you move the needle, because the problem is it changes in a lot of things, not a few things. Not that it wouldn't be good to get rid of sodas and all this. That's part of the problem, but it's going to be much, much tougher than that. And then the question is, okay, even if we decide what to do, where's the will to do it? Uh, you know, I go to meetings with people that are railing against sodas and they don't have soda, they're drinking it at the, at the meeting. It's sort of, this is hard stuff. Here's a, um, one of the first socioeconomic models that uh, I helped develop, and I just show this to show that this is one strategy, and one strategy, so if you look at the ring that's places, work sites, restaurants, all that. One strategy is let's take each behavior setting, let's understand the individual, understand the environmental influences, and make it a healthy place. It, it, it sounds perfectly good. Our success at that has been pretty much nil. So I'm not saying it's maybe not the right way to go, but it hadn't proven to be a, a good way to, to go forward. So, so how do we go forward? And what I want to do in the rest of the talk is to give you my sense of what we need to do differently. Now, I just showed you that nothing's working, so don't feel like you have to agree with me. Uh, you know, you can absolutely have your own opinion, because we aren't, we aren't, what we're doing isn't working. But I think we can think about this differently. So if I'm looking at addressing the environment, I see two approaches. Changing the environment, okay, we can, we're going to talk about that. But another one is actually managing better within the environment. We published a paper a few years ago 
uh, with something like managing your body weight from instinct to intellect. So three or four generations ago, nobody paid attention and everybody, most people were maintaining healthy weight. People that are maintaining healthy weight today are actually doing it with their cognitive skills. They're eating less than they would if they weren't paying attention and they're being more exercising more. Okay, let's embrace that. Let's teach them the skills. So one of the programs we're doing is we're going into the schools to teach kids those energy balance skills. Simple things like if you supersize those french fries, how much do you have to walk to burn it off? Skills that nobody has, but skills, we think it's very much like managing your checkbook. You learn about money in, money out. You may or may not balance your checkbook, but at least you've got a better chance of doing it. So let's give them the skills to manage within the environment. So if we change the environment, how are we going to do it? So the prevailing view right now in my field is the public health view. We're going to do it to them. You know? We're going to make you healthy no matter what you want and we're doing it by fiat. We're going to regulate, we're going to control, we're going to make it so that only healthy stuff is available. Uh, public health is a blunt tool, and there are a lot of good things about it, but I'm not sure we're going to do it by fiat. I want to throw out a different way of thinking, which is we're not going to get anywhere unless we increase demand for the good stuff, and how we, might we do that? Well, I think we've got to focus on venues and institutions, institutions that link basic human needs and the social collective. We really have to bring a social group together to think about this differently. We have to take into account American values. And again, American values are you've got the sense that you're independent, that you have free will, you've got uh, economic engines driving things. If your solution for obesity is against those, good luck with that. I don't think it's going to work. I think we've got to have solutions that are more consistent. And that's why in my field, unfortunately, the private sector sometimes is seen as the enemy. And you have people saying, well, let's treat the food companies like the tobacco companies. I think that's a very, very bad analogy because we don't want the food companies to go away. We want them to change. We want to create healthy communities. And how can we do that? You know, you look at this problem and you say it's really, really a tough problem. But think about it. Over the past, past few years, we've made smoking hard and recycling easy. That's huge, huge changes in society. We went back and looked at some of the keys to these social movements, and interesting enough, there's a lot of things in common. One of the first ones is starting with a crisis. And I would argue that while everybody in this room can probably quote the obesity statistics and so forth, we haven't internalized this as a crisis yet. We, we, we've dealt with it logically, but we haven't dealt with it emotionally. And we may have to do that. It may have to get worse. Um, a science base, we've got the science base. Uh, community sparks, uh, coalition building, mass communication, economics. Interestingly enough, in most of these things, legislation came along at the end. Once we figured out what works, legislation solidified it. We're trying to do the opposite with obesity. We're trying to start with legislation and say, let's solve the problem with legislation. And so far, I think we had not had a lot of success with that. And then emotion and values come into play. So here's what I think we need to think about in changing the environment. Right now in, in this field, it's a little bit like politics. All the uh, dialogue is at the extreme. So you have the public health people saying, we're going to take care of you, we're going to create an environment where you can't make a bad choice. You've got the private sector saying, nannyism, you can't do that, leave people alone, let people choose whatever they want. Neither one of these strategies is working. They, uh, just like politics, the solution is usually in the middle. What we have done a good job at in recent years is creating opportunities for healthier choices. So we've asked restaurants, we've asked food industry to say, make better products, put those products out there, advertise them. This is great, this is fabulous. But, and it's gonna influence hundreds, maybe thousands of people. But what's really missing is the demand. Why are you gonna go out there and choose that healthier choice? A great example is food deserts. Have you heard of food deserts? Uh, food deserts are places where there aren't grocery stores, and people are saying, well, that's why these people are obese. They don't have grocery stores, they don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. I believe there are food deserts, but I don't think people in those food deserts are broccoli deprived. I think when you bring grocery stores in, they're going to say, boy, it's easier for me to get the Snickers. So just creating the healthy option is only one small part of it. Creating demand is what we're not doing and where the action is. So we need to create some new thinking space and some new doing space in the middle if we're going to change the environment. Now, where do we start? I'm going to suggest we start in two places with very different strategies, schools and work sites. So everybody's in schools trying to promote health, and we're doing it by promoting health. We're going in, we're banning good stuff. It's all about health. 
And every time I talk to people in schools, they totally care about the health of their students. But they're really there for test scores. That's what really drives them. So what we've got to do is shift from having it be about health to having it be about productivity. And we have the data. We have data now to know that academic performance is influenced by healthy lifestyles. So when you start talking about bringing a solution in to increase test scores, it's a whole different conversation than a solution to improve health. If health comes along, all the better, wonderful. But it's about productivity in schools. Same thing in work sites. What we're doing right now, most work sites have work site wellness, but we're giving people trinkets to be healthy and we're asking them to do it on their own. So if you're an employee of my company, you're saying, hey, we want you to be healthy, so go out and be healthy and we'll give you some hats and t-shirts and do some contests. Nothing wrong with this, uh, but work sites are where we could really give people the why to link to the motives of the company and the why is productivity. If you believe, as a CEO, Larry, you're CEO, if you believe that uh, the health of your employees is good for the bottom line of your company, then it gives you a whole different way of approaching it. Now you link health to the values of your company. And people say, oh, you're getting in privacy issues. My friends who work in the private sector say, when I go to work for this company, I get a big, thick book of telling me how I have to behave. If I want to work for this company, I've got to behave appropriately and you know, sexual behavior and all this stuff and dress appropriately and everything. We could easily make health a value of the company. If we do that, we hold employees responsible. So on your performance evaluation every year, health is an outcome. We also have to hold management important. If you're holding your employees um, accountable for being healthy, then you've got to give them the tools they need. So are you willing to give them 15 minutes a day to walk? We used to give people 15 minutes a day to smoke. So are we willing to create environments in the work site where we can do this? And uh, I, I think it's what it's going to take. And we could start with public employees if we wanted to. So it's linking individual motivation. I think people want to be healthy with a reason to do it. So if being healthy is important for your job performance, that's a whole different level of motivation for being healthy. So, and, and just to point out, we have, um, we have professions already where fitness and health is evaluated as part of the job. You have tests for these things. But the way we create healthy communities then is to teach kids at school the right thing to do. Look back at the example of recycling. We started recycling to shut our kids up. They didn't want to hear that it was inconvenient or cost more and everything else. It was the right thing to do. And so you have kids coming out saying eating healthy and being active is the right thing to do. You have employees coming out of the work site saying, I'm accountable for being healthy. Now you start going out and looking for some place to take the family to dinner. You're looking for a little bit of healthier options. So the idea is you start creating the demand in the community from these two places. And I think it's a way to start. And this is another way of showing that. You start with work sites and schools, and I think it emanates out into the community. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs that I know you're all familiar with. As humans, we have to get some basic things uh, under control before we go on and do some other things. I think we need a social wellness hierarchy. We want jobs, we want economic growth to start with. If we're out there with solutions on lifestyle and obesity that don't allow us to accomplish these things, it's not gonna work. We have to build these into our strategies. So from studying uh, this problem, I re reviewing the literature over about 150 years, I can conclude that in, uh, obesity is not the result of broken biology. Uh, our challenge is achieving energy balance and fat balance at a healthy weight. The environment is broken, and we clearly have to address it, but this is not going to be easy. But a big part is we're doing a lot of things right, but what we're not doing right now is creating demand. We don't have people out there looking for healthy options. I had dinner the other night with the CEO of King Super's Grocery, which is a part of Kroger's here, one of the largest ones in Colorado. And he said, I would love to have half my store be fresh fruits and vegetables. And if there were demand for it, I make money over this. Yeah, you drive people to my store and I will gladly fill the aisles with healthy stuff. We can't ask private industry to both create the options and the demand. That's where we have to help. So what do we need? Well, heck, we need it all. We need environmental restructuring. We need uh, small changes, behavioral nudges. We need individual aspiration. But we really need to create a social collective around the why. Why do we want to live healthier lifestyles? And I want to finish up telling you 
uh, about our new center, our new health and wellness center. Um, we created this to tackle this problem of unhealthy lifestyles. I've been at the University of Colorado for about 20 years. We started with around 15 investigators interested in this. We're now at about 115. So a huge research area, everything from molecular biology to community interventions that really link to health and wellness and obesity. And what we've tried to do is to pull that together in one building. So this building literally just opened three weeks ago. It's a clinical research facility. So in one wing, we have nutrition laboratories ranging from a uh, metabolic kitchen to a research restaurant to a research grocery store. We can actually study shopping behavior, eating behavior. We can do any kind of diet manipulation. On the other wing, we have a fitness center, which is a state-of-the-art fitness center for exercise interventions. It's also the campus fitness center, so we do worksite wellness there. So we have the ability to do just about any kind of diet or physical activity study available. We have a clinic that we call our wellness clinic. This is a large clinic where people come and focus on wellness. It's also education space and uh, translation space. But we're really, we're called the Health and Wellness Center, and I want to talk a minute about distinguishing health from wellness. We've talked pretty much about health, about unhealthy lifestyles and correcting unhealthy lifestyles, but there's a flip side of this, and the flip side of that is wellness. And what we want to do is to concentrate both on health and wellness. And here's a cartoon to show how we think about it. What we're looking at is poor health is below the line. Uh, what you see are risk factors increasing, chronic disease developing. It would be fabulous if we just brought people back to the line, if we just prevented chronic disease. Boy, it'd be wonderful, it'd help quality of life, it'd help healthcare costs. But we actually think there's an opportunity to go above the line. Wellness is the positive stuff. It's not just lack of sickness, it's um, body weight, it's diet, it's physical activity, it's sleep, it's stress, it's relationships, it's appreciation of beauty, it's mindfulness. So we've begun to think of wellness as a whole different way and one of the things that we're working on are ways to measure that. So we've developed wellness scores and we're looking at markers of wellness. Now again, We'd be happy if we could deal with unhealthy lifestyles, but we think the future is actually giving people the positive stuff, focusing on keeping people healthy. Uh, at the University of Colorado uh, Medical Center, it's a great place to come when you're sick or when you have a disease. What we're trying to do is to make it a great place to come to actually keep from doing that, and eventually a great place to come to maximize your wellness and your quality of life. What we want to do here, um, I talked before about some new thinking space. I don't think we're even close to coming up with solutions to the obesity problem. I think we could implement every idea that's been out there. And have people seen the uh, HBO documentary, Way to the Nation? How many people have seen that? You guys don't watch much TV, do you? There's a uh, four-part series on HBO, Way to the Nation, about obesity. And I think it does a terrific job of pointing out the problem. I think it does a lousy job of pointing out the solution, but a really, really good job of pointing out the problem. But we believe that the solutions to this problem haven't been created yet. And so we want to create some new thinking space, much like Larry has brought together smart people approaching things from a different point of view at the symposium. We want to bring smart people together from different points of view to approach the whole lifestyle thing. We need some creativity here. We need people who aren't entrenched in this with functional fixedness, who can come and look at it from a new way. We need new strategies. What we hope to do then is from that new thinking, we, we do the research here in our center. And from the research, we eventually develop programs and initiatives that we can evaluate, and those that are effective, we take out into the community. So people often ask me, you know, has anybody done what you've done? Well, Everybody's done parts of it, but I think what we've done is to pull this together where we've got one seamless way of looking from developing new thinking to eventually taking that out into the community. Too often in our field, there's a gap between developing the knowledge and somebody getting that and, and taking it out to affect people's lives. We want it to be a seamless transition. We're very much um, about partnerships, and you probably got that from my talk before. I believe the private sector is much more able to deal with the obesity problem than the government. 
I'm not a fan of the government being able to solve this. I think the government will have a role, but I think the way we solve it is somebody is going to make money from people being healthy, and I think we need to encourage that. So we're very much looking about partnerships. I put this slide in because I think it's something we should think about. I come back to the omics, and all you guys just doing fabulous stuff there. What can the omics help us with? Can it help us with targeting? Can it help us with ultimately matching uh, treatment to person, personalized medicine? Uh, really would love to hear some ideas there. Information technology. It's fabulous now. With my iPhone, I can say, I'm in Boulder, it's lunch, I'm hungry, I want a healthy meal. There's all kind of technology for doing it. My phone will tell me how active I am. I can set goals. We've got to use this technology more and more and more. But again, without the why, it's not going to work. So I oftentimes point to the hospital at our campus and say, this is the present, which is sick care, and the future is wellness. And I do think it's the future. Um, I'm worried because we hadn't figured this out. We, we clearly are on the, the leading or the bleeding edge here in trying to figure this out. But I think it's the way we have to go if we're going to solve these big problems. I want to finish with, with a couple of slides to say, what would a strategy look like? The Institute of Medicine just came out with, with five strategies to address obesity, and here they are. Make it easier for people to work physical activity in their daily lives. Generate an environment where the healthy food beverage options are the routine easy choice. Improve messages about physical activity and nutrition. Expand the role of healthcare providers, insurers, and employers in preventing obesity. Make schools a national focus for obesity presentation. What do you do with that? It's the right words, but it's of absolutely no use in going forward. And in fact, one of the people on this report said, to reverse obesity, we will have to radically change the way we live. How many people want to do that? How many people will sign up to radically change the way we live? I'm not. If that's what it takes, it's hopeless. I think we've got to get a different message out there, a different message that none of those things are actionable. I don't know what to do with any of those. I agree with each as an outcome but it's not going to help me get going. And I don't think we're going, to, we're going to radically reverse the way we live. I think it is the American approach. What's the minimum kinds of things we have to do to solve this problem? How can we change the environment in a way that gives us most of what we want and changes it so that we can um, be at a lower weight? So here's a better plan. I think it has to start with the philosophy. And the philosophy is around starting with small changes, creating demand, partnerships. We have to work with the private sector. Walmart has a better ability to change your behavior than the CDC. I would back Walmart any day on that. Um, we have to look at who the stakeholders are. And this is follow the money. If suddenly we're living healthy lifestyles, who benefits from that? Who are the people that are going to make money? Let's get those people to the table right now to help craft the strategy. And we have to develop a plan. And that plan is going to be a public-private partnership. Right now we have... Uh, initiatives coming from the government that industry opposes. We have industry initiatives that the government opposes. We've got to come to the middle and we've got to do some strategies that everybody is all in on and we've got to move those forward. We have to look at the role of government, uh, private sector, nonprofits. I think one of the roles of the government is to be the, the fair, uh, you know, the, 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 goal the scorekeeper or the referee in all this as we ask industry to change. Great example, Walt Disney Company in all their theme parks make um, kids' meals come with milk and, fry and, and veggies. You can ask for Coke and fries, but it's flipping around and making it the default. Okay, if all the fast foods agree to do that, then the role of the government is to make sure nobody plays dirty, nobody tries to get a competitive advantage. So we have to look at all those roles. Creating demand, I think we start with work sites and schools. And ultimately, we have to know what's in it for people before they get involved. We have to look at the ROI for everybody. I like this quote from Walter Lippmann. We've changed our environment more quickly than we know how to change ourselves. He said that in 1915. It's true today. Like everybody else, it takes a village. Uh, the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center, uh, the leadership and the funding, and we are out there beginning to try to make a difference. We need lots of help. I would very much love to get your ideas, um, uh, your opinions on how we do this. I believe unless we can get a handle on unhealthy lifestyles, it's going to overwhelm everything else we're doing. Thank you.